Okay, so I'm sure many of you have either said it or thought it. Where is God? Especially over this past year. Yes. We've seen a change in our community, in our nation, and even the world. Amen. In fact, the very fabric of our society has been challenged on a number of levels. Yet the question remains is, where is God? Now, in my own life, I've had some where is God moments. This past year, trust me, has been no exception. Psalms chapter 23 verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And that became a reality this week because I had to start work after two months being off. And it was an adjustment. But it's getting better. But what I want to show is there is a book. It's entitled A Shepherd's Look at Psalms 23 by W. Philip Keller. Notice what he says about this verse. Quote, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it does not say I die there or I stop there, but rather walk through. Amen. The book goes on to say that there was a time when this particular author had a ranch and some shepherds had some sheep. They says, hey, do you mind if our sheep be able to have a little water? And they said, sure, but it was in the valley. Keep that in mind. See, as Christians, we sooner or later discover that it is in the valley of our lives that we find refreshment from God himself. It's not until we have walked with him through some very deep troubles that we discover he can lead us to find our refreshment in him right there in the midst of our difficult times. That's from the book, pages 100 and 103. And I want you to consider something. Many times God doesn't take us out of a situation, but brings us through a situation. So I'm going to go back about 20 years in time. I wish I could. I wish my hair could grow back, but that's another story altogether. I remember just before 9-11, I remember telling my place of appointment that I was going to take a day off because we're going to be moving. This was just before 9-11 happened. And we were with our mother-in-law. It was a big house, and she wanted to move to a very spacious 600-foot-plus home with two kids. So it was, let's say, a little cramped. But anyway, so we had moved there. And there's some very challenging things when you're just being with family. But... Here's what I want to bring out. My mother-in-law went in for a back operation. She went to the hospital, in fact, where Arlene was working, and she got an infection. That was bad because she ended up having a fever of about 104 for about a month. Remember, these are pre-COVID days, okay? So it was horrible. In fact, many of Arlene's relatives... We're saying, your mom's going to die. She says, no, he's not. she's not going to die. She's going to live and testify of the Lord. And she's alive today. Amen. Hallelujah. Besides having a hard time trying to find another job, which I did at that time, at least one that pays to provide for our needs, we had this neighbor, and it was not Mr. Rogers. And she didn't get the memo where you're supposed to love that neighbor as thyself. And she actually was a relative. It was a very difficult situation. Arlene went through some situations even because she was taking care of her mom's checkbook. Some people were accusing her of messing with it. And that wasn't the case either. But I want you to consider something. I got to the point one night, I said, Lord, I know you're there, but do something. This is just going on too far. I can't handle this. I went to bed that night, and I had one of the most vivid dreams I ever had. In the dream, I remember putting out my hand and saying, no, 
to stop the accusations. But even more important, I heard a voice say, the fever is broken. Remember, my wife worked at the hospital where our mother-in-law, my mother-in-law was. But check this out. I woke up, I gave a call to my wife. I says, "Hun, you won't believe this. I had a dream and your mom's fever broke in the dream. She says, Dave, it broke last night. <laughs> Ooh, man, you talk about, wow, God just, and that from that point on, no matter what, I says, God, I know not only that you are there, but this is a testimony that when we're at our wit's end, and that's usually when it happens, God does come through. And he did come through for us in a mighty, mighty way. But one thing we need to realize is that God is in the very midst of our storms. God is always willing to be with us, but we need to be near to him. And that's what it really needs for us to grasp inside. And it would have been nice if we didn't have the bad neighbor, the accusations, the unemployment. But God had us go through that. And why? Because in order to comfort others, we would have to understand what it meant to be comfort ourselves. And that's exactly what God did behind the scenes. He had a purpose. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. In fact, it just came to mind. I remember we had our prophet say it in our home. And we were going through a terrible time. And all he did was just give us a hug. Today, it's okay. And man, that just, just made our day. But you know what? That man went through a lot. And I says, Lord, how can you go through so much? And yet at the same time, he had that comfort that he was able to give to us. And so when you're going through hard times, remember someday you're going to be able to share with someone else about the mercy and the tenderness of God. So I want you to look at Matthew chapter 14. For your reference, we're looking at verses 22 through 32. Now, I'm sure many have heard this story before. It's a very familiar story. And you were probably taught that it's a lesson of faith. And it is. But I want to come at it from a little different angle. Now, Jesus had told his disciples, listen, I want you to get in a boat and I want you to go to the other side. I'm going to send the multitude away. I'm going to go in the mountain to pray. And he did. And for many hours, Jesus did. But then the next part of the story is 3 o'clock in the morning. And what do we see? Jesus would be walking on the water. Matthew chapter 14, verse 26 says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. You know, sometimes we don't expect God to move in a certain way and conclude that it can't be God. Yet even before the service, I, I was just checking out the church. I didn't realize the miracle in the way that they got the church, besides my father-in-law, the miracle that he had. God had done two unique miracles. God moved in both ways that they did not expect, but he still moved. And that's a testimony. I think that's phenomenal. But you know what? What we do see is that this particular miracle got their attention. God doesn't always move the way that we think he's going to move. Yet in the midst of the storm, Jesus came walking on the water. I want you to think about that. The disciples were with him day and night. He's walking on the water. They don't even recognize him. Let that sink in for a minute. When you consider the storms that we go through, many times God is near, but we don't recognize him because we're so focused on the storms. And yet, 
He's right in front of us. Verse 27 says, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So how do we know something is of God? The same way that the disciples also learned. It was the word of God that was spoken to them that made all the difference. The Apostle John instructs us not to believe every spirit, but to try the spirits, whether they are of God. We know that which is of God by the written word, the Bible, and we see it lines up. That's how it's made simple. Yet there's more to this passage than meets the eye. You know, in our culture, when someone comes to the door, what do they do? They knock, you say, who is it? And then they usually respond, say, hey, it is Jim. Son of Felix. Son of Felix. <laughs> but it was different back in Jesus' day. And that's what I want to kind of bring out. Those of Jesus' day were trained to hear the voice of a friend. So when Jesus came walking on the water, what did he say? He didn't say, it is Jesus. He said, it is I. Though Jesus used this experience to teach his disciples to hear the voice of God, even when it doesn't look like God, that is why the Bible is so important. If we don't listen to God by the scriptures, then how will we know when someone is being deceitful? Remember, in the garden, the devil said, Yea, has God said. You know, folks, in the garden, what happened between the devil and the woman, it's so much there. In those two verses, there is so much. When he says, really? Did God say you can't eat of any of the trees of the garden? See, the enemy will always take the restriction that's for our protection and maximize it and magnetize it. But the Lord will always show the abundance. Notice that in the garden, he said, of all the trees thou mayest freely eat. That was what the Lord focused on, his goodness. Where what did the devil do? He focused on the restriction. I said, why is that restriction there? Keep that in mind. Be careful when someone says, hey, you know, does the Bible really teach that? And all they use is worldly wisdom and not the scriptures themselves. We need to let the scripture interpret scripture. But my admonishment to you is that if you spend little to no time listening to God speak through his word, then how will you be able to discern when God is really speaking? Consider this. If Jesus' own disciples that were with him day and night had a hard time, are we better than they? It's just something to think about. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Peter had doubts, but the key to recognize that during this storm, God is there. And Peter walked on the water by faith, but he also listened to the voice that was speaking to him. Verse 29. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, folks, I know a lot of people pick on Peter about this. But besides Peter and Jesus, who do you know has walked on the water? We're not talking about frozen water either, okay? We're not talking about ice. <laughs> I'm talking about how many do you have you ever heard someone do that? He's, he's in a very small class. So I think we need to look at the whole scripture, not just at his failings, but the lesson that we can learn in hearing from God, okay? But when he saw the wind was bolstering, in verse 30, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. Verse 31, and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? And folks, I don't know about you, but we weren't there. But did you ever think about this? Jesus is on the water. Peter gets out of the water. We don't know how far he was to Jesus. It said immediately he just grabbed him. Was he stretched arms? I don't know. 
We don't know what happened, but I believe it's kind of interesting because when they got back in the boat, they're like, man, this this is not just man. This is something a lot. This, this has got to be God right in our midst. They knew something was really up with that. But look in verse 32. I want you to catch this. And when they were come into the ship, listen carefully, the wind ceased. So where is God? To the believer, he is as near as we are to him. Notice that when Jesus entered the ship, there was a calm. Thus God is there even when it seems that he's not. He speaks to our storm, and that's why we need to read the Bible, so God can speak to the storm that we are in. When we are close in communion with him, which is prayer, it's kind of like Jesus coming into the boat. He's coming right in the midst of the storm. And he's coming it because he spoke peace to it. I can't emphasize enough the importance of not only the Bible, but a prayer. Psalms 145.18 says, The Lord is nigh unto all of them that call upon him. And James 4.8 says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Now, God's not always going to answer every question you have during our storm, but he will join us right in the midst as long as we remain near to him. Then he can enter our storm and speak to the storm. There was a contest some years ago. And I guess it's quite a bit of money that a painter could actually win. And in the content contest, the purpose was to draw a piece. So the first painter got up, drew a beautiful picture of a lake, a beautiful picture of the shepherd with the sheep. And there's birds singing in the trees and the sun just clustering over the lake. It was absolutely gorgeous. But the second painter got up, he did something a little different. It was pitch black thunder and lightning, and the boats were tossing to and fro, the trees violently shaking in the wind. It was horrible. It was horrific. Totally different point. But the second painter did something that the first painter didn't. The very bottom of the picture, there was a little bird standing on a rock, just singing away. It wasn't chicken nuggets either. <laughs> That's my, my brother's chicken. But it was singing away, and there was just a light stream of light. The bird didn't have a care in the world, even though it was chaotic all over the place. Afterward, they decided that the second one was the one that should win the prize. Because biblical peace is not when nothing is wrong, but biblical peace is when everything is wrong. There is lightning and thunder and the winds are blowing and the circumstances are all against you and nothing looks right and still you have a song despite the chaos that's around you. Isaiah 26, 33 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind stayed on thee. With that being said, I'm going to end with a poem. And I always like to do this. When we were in Bible college, the president of the Bible college says, you know what, you guys should repeat your points over and over again at the end, just so people get it. I'm like, man, that's going to be boring. <laughs> but I thought to myself, but if you put it in a poem, maybe that would be a way of reinforcing what you're trying to bring out, and people can be blessed by it. So I hope you'll be blessed by it. Even though we went through a lot of circumstances with our mother-in-law, and but God broke through the fever and broke and brought her healing. And even though we go through a lot, we know that God is there all the time. So here's a little poem that I wrote to finish up this morning. I know how it is to face a trial or two with no job to speak of. My good days were few. But then one night I cried out to him. My circumstances were horrific and my future looked in. The breakthrough came and was confirmed the next day. Now I know God is there even when I can't see the way. God will be present at your raging sea. So if you feel troubled, 
remember this key. Though you may not see him in the midst of your storm, he calls out to you, your situation will transform. As he speaks peace to your soul, no matter what you've gone through, when you draw near to him in all that you do.